Um, welcome everyone to FuseNet's briefing on the food security outlook for Afghanistan and Yemen for the period of October 2022 to May 2023. My name is Diana, Senior Food Security Analyst based in FuseNet's Washington DC office. And in today's briefing, first, as usual, for anyone who's unfamiliar, I'll give a quick overview of FuseNet's approach to early warning analysis, including a look at the integrated phase classification or IPC scale that we use to classify acute food security outcomes. And then we'll turn to our content for Afghanistan, uh, pause for questions, and then continue with our content for Yemen. So FuseNet's approach to early warning analysis relies on an eight-step scenario development process illustrated on this slide. And within a livelihoods framework that allows us to understand how households typically access food and income to meet their basic needs, we start our analysis by gathering data and information to inform an understanding of households' current access to food and income and any gaps that they may be facing in their ability to meet their current needs. And we use this to classify current food security outcomes. Following our current situation analysis, we then develop evidence-based assumptions about the likely evolution of key drivers of acute food insecurity throughout our projection period. And we translate these expectations um, into expectations for impacts on households' access to food and income in that period. We then synthesize these expectations into an understanding of whether households' access to food and income is likely to meet their needs um, or any gaps that they face and classify most likely food security outcomes during the projection period according to the scale of any gaps that they may face. And we do this first at the household level and then at the area level based on the population distribution of food security outcomes that we expect. Finally, we always identify any events that might change the most likely scenario, such as a change in crop production expectations based on a change in the rainfall forecast, for example. And for classifying and mapping acute food security outcomes, FuseNet uses the globally recognized IPC scale. Um, the scale has five phases, which most are likely familiar with, of increasing severity defined in terms of the extent to which households are able or unable to meet their food and essential non-food needs. And these phases at the household level range from phase one, none, to phase five, catastrophe. And I would note that it's in phase three and higher that households require urgent humanitarian assistance to prevent food consumption gaps or damage to livelihoods that would threaten their food consumption in the future. And after we formulated expectations for the population distribution of household level food security outcomes, we then assign area level classifications based on the worst phase of acute food insecurity that at least 20% of the population of any area is facing. As an example, for an area to be classified in phase three overall, the worst off 20% of households would be facing phase three outcomes or worse outcomes. So a key point for interpreting our mapping um, is that within any given area, there can always be households facing worse outcomes than the area level classification. But this group would just be less than 25% of the area's total population. And at the area level, the phase definitions are quite similar to those at the household level, but the area level classifications also include criteria for incorporating population level data on acute malnutrition and mortality. So turning to our content for Afghanistan, first to orient us in the season, October and November are considered the post-harvest period in Afghanistan. So this is a time when households are still benefiting from seasonal food and income from crop production and sales and agricultural labor from the summer and fall. This is also a time when many households stock food for the coming winter. October is also the beginning of the main precipitation season, um, which lasts through May. And along with the start of the precipitation season, households engage in planting for the main agricultural season. Um, and the planting period is start, generally starts in October, lasting through November, December. So 
Turning to our current situation updates, starting with the economy and exchange rate. The key point here is that economic conditions remain quite poor in Afghanistan following the significant economic shocks that occurred with the Taliban takeover of Kabul last year. And these shocks include the sharp included the sharp um, reduction in foreign exchange inflows and development funding and the dramatic reduction in investments and private sector activity that occurred. However, in 2022, the economy has stabilized somewhat, though it has not fully recovered. And one indicator that illustrates this trend is the exchange rate. And the graph on the slide is showing the national average exchange rate since June 2021. And as you can see, the exchange rate has been generally stable throughout 2022, supported by ongoing foreign currency auctions. <clears throat> So the stabilization of the economy, as well as the significant reduction in conflict since the political transition in August 2021, has supported some recovery in business and livelihood activities. According to a private sector rapid survey conducted by the World Bank, more than three quarters of surveyed firms were operational at the time of that survey in June 2022, up from two thirds of surveyed firms in November of 2021. However, the economy remains poor overall and unemployment rates are above average, particularly in urban areas with many still experiencing significantly below average income earning. And the depreciation of the currency that occurred in the second half of 2021 prior to the stabilization also contributed to rising prices in the country, particularly of imported goods, including fuel, fertilizer and food products, and those impacts are still being felt. And you can see that illustrated here with this chart, which shows prices of diesel and fertilizer, which are commodities that are essential for livelihoods. And this is at the national level from June 2021 to the third week of November 2022. And the red box is just, is just highlighting 2022 to date. And despite declining somewhat since the middle of the year, in October 2022, prices of diesel were 50% higher than prices recorded at the same time last year, and prices of urea fertilizer were 67% higher than the same time last year. So this continues to strain livelihoods, and in addition to being key livelihoods inputs, the high fuel prices um, are resulting in high transportation costs, which are a key reason why prices of food and other non-food commodities remain elevated. And this chart is showing trends in retail prices of wheat flour, rice, and vegetable oil, which are three key staple food commodities that make up the majority of the minimum food basket. Um, and this is in Kabul from January 2020 to November 2022. And in the first uh, segment of the chart that is shown in the first red box, you can see the increase in prices that occurred in the latter half of 2021 following the Taliban takeover. And then the second box in the middle is showing the first half of 2022 when uh, a slight decline in food prices alongside the recovery of the currency at the beginning of the year was followed by further food price increases, largely due to rising fuel prices and rising global food prices. And the third box is showing the rest of 2022 to date. And in this time, prices declined with the wheat harvest and also um, largely due to declining global cooking oil prices. Most recently, though, as of November 2022, the cost of this partial minimum food basket in Kabul was 11% higher than the same time last year. And though the gap between current and last year's prices has closed since several months ago um, in June when prices were 47% higher than the previous year. This is largely due to the fact that at um, October of last, I mean, in November of last year, excuse me, food prices were already considerably eleva elevated. So it's a more elevated um, point of comparison. Um, compared to the five-year average, meanwhile, which is shown uh, with the horizontal blue line in dashes, the cost in, of the minimum food basket um, shown here in November 2022 remains 46% higher um, than the five-year average. 
And these high food prices have been significantly reducing household purchasing power. And the graph on the slide illustrates this using proxy indicators for purchasing power for laborers and for pastoralists, which are two key livelihood strategies for poor households in Afghanistan. And the blue line is showing First, the amount of staple wheat flour that an unskilled laborer could purchase from one full day's work at prevailing wage rates and prices. And the green line is showing the same thing, the amount of staple wheat flour that a pastoralist could purchase, meanwhile, from the sale of one sheep at prevailing prices. And you can see that after declining fairly steadily since the beginning of 2021, purchasing power for unskilled laborers has improved slightly in the second half of 2022, driven by both declining wheat flour prices and increasing labor wages, while purchasing power for pastoralists has remained generally stable, with declining wheat flour prices being counteracted by declining sheep prices. So in November 2022, a pastoralist could purchase 11% less wheat flour compared to the same time last year, and a laborer could purchase 7% less wheat flour. Um, again, this is uh, these figures represent uh, a closing gap compared to this compared to the gap that um, existed between current and last year's prices as of June 2022. Um, Again, though, I would note that this is because purchasing power was already significantly below average in um, November of last year, which is the point of comparison for um, November 2022. And in addition to what we saw on the previous slide, there has been a reduction in opportunities for income earnings since the Taliban takeover. For instance, the ILO International Labor, Labor Organization estimates that around 500,000 people lost their jobs in the third quarter of 2021. And there was also a reduction in demand for labor, which is an important source of income for poor households, especially in urban areas. And the graph on this slide shows demand for casual labor across eight key markets of Afghanistan with Kabul separated from the other seven. And the box is showing the period since the Taliban takeover. <clears throat> and you can see the decline following the Taliban takeover. Um, excuse me. Um, yeah, you can see the decline following the Taliban takeover um, in August, um, which is the beginning of the period highlighted in the red box. Um, following that, looking at the orange line, you can see that demand for labor increased seasonally in some areas uh, during the spring and summer. Uh, and this is in line with typical seasonal trends, but again has been declining since May along with typical seasonal trends. And in November of 2022, at the national level, demand for labor was 16% lower than the same time last year overall. And beyond that, you can see from this chart that demand for labor has been generally declining year on year. So this reduced purchasing power is, um, so, I'm sorry, this reduced demand for labor is um, so has been significantly impacting um, income earning for households dependent on this source, particularly in urban areas. On the other hand, I do want to point out that there are two key income sources that we expect are providing poor households with notably more income than usual. And these are income from cash crop production, including poppy, um, due to increased cultivation and rising prices following the Taliban takeover. And second, income from foreign remittances. Um, we expect are above average given um, the high levels of need and that Afghans abroad have likely increased support to family back home to the extent possible. Though we expect that these increases likely do not exceed increased expenditure needs for households in Afghanistan overall. So against that background of generally below average income earning and above average prices, um, I want to look now at um, agriculture and crop production, which is uh, the backbone of livelihoods for many rural households. 
And Afghanistan typically produces about half of its national wheat supply. However, the past two seasons have been below average production seasons, as you can see um, on this chart. And you can see from the orange bar segments that rain-fed wheat production has been recording the greatest losses. And this has resulted in many rural households facing below average um, wheat stocks and above average cereal purchase requirements in consequence um, in many areas, especially rain fed areas um, at the time of, and this is at the time of year when households normally stock food for winter. And this is also with prices significantly above average. So households are, are facing um, reduced stocks, increased expenditure requirements, and reduced purchasing power all at the same time. Now, given the high levels of need in the country, emergency humanitarian food assistance programming was significantly scaled up following the Taliban takeover. As you can see um, in this graph, the BFP targeted a high of 18 million people in May of 2022 more than 11 times the number reached in May of the prior two years. WFP then scaled down to target 10 million people per month in the post-harvest period from June to September. But again, this is more than five times the number reached during this period in prior years. And more recently, WFP has assisted or plans to assist 15 million people per month from October to December as part of lean season scale up. So given the significant reductions in income earning and above average prices, this assistance is expected to be playing a significant role in preventing worse food security outcomes among a national population of 30 to 40 million people. And before turning to our current food security outcomes, I want to touch quickly on the start of the 2022-2023 precipitation season. The first map shows cumulative precipitation totals in the season to date as of November 25th, and it is presenting the precipitation totals as the difference from the long-term average for that time period. And you can see from the green and blue colors that in contrast to previous forecasts, much of the north and northeast has received above average precipitation to date, which is a positive sign for the planting season. And the map on the right is showing um, cumulative cumulative precipitation for the entire previous season um, for a point of reference and comparison. Um, and you can see that in that season, the northern rain-fed belt circled experienced some of the worst precipitation deficits. So now looking at current food security outcomes, this is FuseNet's remote monitoring map of food security outcomes in October, November, 2022. And as most people know, in January 2022, FuseNet officially transitioned Afghanistan to a remote monitoring country given the Taliban takeover uh, and the fact that we no longer have colleagues working in the country. And so the way to interpret this remote monitoring map is that the worst area level phase we expected in Afghanistan in October to November 2022 is stressed exclamation mark or IBC phase two exclamation mark. Um, and this is given seasonal improvements in availability of food from own crop production and income from crop sales and harvesting labor opportunities alongside the significant humanitarian assistance um, that, as denoted by the exclamation mark, is expected to be preventing worse food security outcomes at the area level. Now turning to our projection period through May 2023. I will point out that the 2022-2023 precipitation season and main growing period will continue throughout the projection period. And though January typically marks the start of the lean season, we expect that this will likely start early for many rural households this year, given consecutive seasons of poor crop production, high prices, and below average income earning. Lastly, in the spring, availability of seasonal food and income sources will begin to increase again after low levels during the colder winter months. And this will include income from the spring planting season and from poppy harvesting. So turning to our key assumptions for the projection period. 
First, revised forecasts, such as the one shown in the map on the right, now indicate that despite a third consecutive La Nina year, cumulative precipitation in the 2022-23 season is most likely to be near average. This is because the ongoing La Nina is not forecast to increase precipitation in the tropical Indo-West Pacific, um, as ha has been the case in the prior seasons. So this represents a revision to the assumption used in the October analysis available on our website. Um, revisions to the analysis of the likely impacts on wheat production and food security outcomes are underway, but this is certainly a good sign um, and uh, some much needed positive news after two consecutive drought years. Um, income earning from the livestock sector is expected to be near normal overall. And this is with above average livestock prices compensating for higher production costs, such as for fodder. However, income earning from livestock will likely be below average in areas worst affected by drought in the prior two seasons due to declining herd sizes and in some cases declining prices where households engage in atypical sales during the coming lean season. Prices of food and essential non-food commodities will likely increase and remain significantly above average due to high global prices and high transportation costs. And below average national crop production and higher regional prices will also contribute to above average wheat flour prices, which are generally expected to increase throughout the winter and lean seasons in line with typical seasonal trends. Meanwhile, access to income from other key sources, including label, labor, will likely remain at seasonally low levels during the winter months and improve in the spring, as is typical. However, overall income earning is likely to remain below average due to the poor economic conditions. On the other hand, income from remittances will likely continue at above average levels and increase seasonally during the winter and lean seasons. Finally, based on recent patterns and historical trends of scale up during the winter and lean seasons, humanitarian assistance will likely continue at significantly above average levels with WFP reaching at least 15 million people per month. And this slide shows FuseNet's projected food security outcomes through May, 2023. So first, in the beginning of the October to January period, the whole period of which is um, on the left, many households will still have access to food and income from the recent harvest. However, an increasing number of rural households in areas where crop production was poor will exhaust food stocks atypically early during this period. And in provinces worst affected by drought, we expect that area level crisis exclamation mark IPC phase three exclamation mark outcomes will reemerge by around November, December. Um, and humanitarian assistance are expected to prevent worse outcomes. Then through the peak of the lean season around March, a growing number of households in rural and urban areas will likely deteriorate uh, to crisis or worse outcomes as they exhaust remaining food stocks, resources, um, and coping capacity and amid seasonally rising prices. At the peak of the lean season in March 2023, an estimated 9 to 10 million people will likely be in need of humanitarian food assistance. And in April and May of 2023, um, the final two months of our projection period, uh, seasonal access to food and income from harvesting labor opportunities and crop production will begin to reduce the population facing crisis or worse outcomes. Okay, so with that, we'll begin our content for Yemen. First, for orientation in the season, this is FuseNet's seasonal calendar for Yemen, and though there is significant variability in seasonality across regions of the country, this shows some broad trends at the national level. And I'll highlight that in October, the second rainy season concluded with significantly above average rainfall, which resulted in flooding and localized crop damage in widespread areas of the country. And the main harvest period of cereals and fruits is also ongoing now, and this is providing rural households with some limited seasonal food and income. So 
So as everyone is likely aware, conflict has been the main driver of acute food insecurity in Yemen for many years. And this continues to be the case, although the ceasefire that entered into force on April 2nd of this year has led to an overall reduction in conflict, those ceasefire viol violations continue to occur. And this graph is showing the number of conflict incidents of different types in the bar segments and the number of conflict-driven fatalities, um, the red dots, during each month of the truce period in 2022 on the right of the graph and compared to the same time period in 2021 on the left. And as you can see, looking at the gray bars showing armed clashes and orange bars showing air and drone strikes, the reduction in the number of these two types of incidents declined um, during the truce period. On the other hand, the number of incidents of shelling and artillery attacks and the number of incidents involving remote explosives increased during the truce period, given some shifting patterns of conflict. However, during the truce period since April, rates of conflict-driven fatalities have been the lowest recorded in several years, largely due to the sharp reduction in Saudi coalition airstrikes. And declining levels of conflict have also resulted in a reduction in civilian casualties, as well as lower levels of population displacement, improved humanitarian access, and some slight improvements in the business and trade environment, although some key trade routes remain closed. And I would note that more recently, despite the official expiration of the truce, unfortunately, on October 2nd, conflict has not re-escalated. Instead, both parties of the conflict continue to operate in a period of unofficial truce alongside ongoing negotiations. And as mentioned, the reduction in conflict did lead to some improvements in business activity. However, overall macroeconomic conditions in Yemen remain very poor given the impacts of more than seven years of protracted conflict and multiple additional shocks, including the COVID pandemic and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And one key way that the conflict continues to drive poor economic conditions is through shortages of government revenue um, due to the overall quite poor business environment amongst other factors, which is leading to insufficient provision of public services and disruption to payments of civil servant salaries across the country. And associated low levels of foreign exchange reserves controlled by the internationally recognized government or IRG in particular continue to result in instability of the local currency in IRG controlled areas. And this is important because Yemen is highly dependent on imports of essential food and non-food commodities, including fuel. And so the exchange rate is a key determinant of domestic food prices. So this chart is showing the parallel market exchange rate in two key reference markets, the IRG reference market of Aden and in areas controlled by the Sana'a based authorities or SBA, the reference market of Sana'a City. And as you can see in IRG controlled areas, the currency depreciated throughout most of 2021. Um, however, notable periods of recovery occurred first in late 2021, alongside the introduction of a new currency auction mechanism by the Central Bank of Yemen in Aden. And then in April 2022, alongside the truce, um, the associated formation of the new presidential leadership council in IRG controlled areas and an announcement of a significant um, bill at $3 billion financial aid package from Gulf countries, though this um, to date has not been delivered. And though the currency has continued to depreciate overall throughout the rest of 2022 to date, the currency auction mechanism is providing some greater stability compared to the past. And most recently in October, 2020, the value of the currency in IRG controlled areas was similar to previous months and 8% higher than the same time last year. However, despite positive developments, the exchange rate still displays significant volatility in response to political and economic events um, within any given month and has overall depreciated by 16% since April of 2022. Um, 
which is immediately after the that that period of recovery that we see. Meanwhile, in SBA controlled areas um, shown in the green line, the value of the local currency remains generally stable at level 6% higher than last year, with the overall stability resulting from a combination of strict control measures and better supply of foreign currency from trade and remittances. And an additional positive development during the truce period has been the increase in fuel availability in SBA controlled areas given eased restrictions for the entry of oil ships. This chart is showing monthly fuel import levels through Yemen's Western Red Sea ports, which are in SBA controlled territory from January, 2019 to October, 2022. And you can see that following the eased restrictions, fuel import levels increased significantly. And this has fortunately ended the severe fuel shortages that have been ongoing in SBA controlled areas since early 2020, which had been <clears throat> negatively impacting livelihoods dependent on fuel, such as in the agriculture or transportation sectors, as well as putting upward pressure on food prices and generally reducing purchasing power for millions of people. And in both IRG and SBA controlled areas, authorities have lowered official fuel prices several times in recent months at this point due to declining global prices, as well as in SBA areas the improved fuel availability and reduced cost of importation. However, fuel prices remain notably higher than last year and significantly above average. And now turning to look at food prices, and food prices uh, are very important to food security in Yemen as most poor households, even in rural areas, depend on markets for a notable share of their food. On this slide, we're looking at the cost of the minimum food basket in IRG and SBA areas from January 2015 to October 2022. And you can see that food prices have been increasing year on year in both IRG and SBA areas, with IRG areas worst affected due to the depreciation of the currency. More recently, in March 2022, um, indicated with the vertical line, Prices increased sharply following the Russian invasion of Ukraine as market actors responded to concerns about the future food supply. And Yemen was particularly hard hit by the impacts of the crisis because more than 90% of the country's staple wheat supply is typically imported, and imports from Ukraine and Russia together previously supplied 42% of Yemen's annual domestic wheat requirements. But following the increasing prices at that time, staple food prices declined again in April alongside the start of the truce and the resultant appreciation of the currency in both IRG and SBA areas. However, since then, staple food prices have been trending upward again in IRG controlled areas, driven in part by depreciation of the currency in this time period, though another major factor is traders' reluctance to decrease prices despite declining global prices in order to preserve profit margins. So as of October 2022, the cost of the MFB was 18% higher than the same time last year in IRG controlled areas and 28% higher in SBA, I'm sorry, 24% higher in SBA controlled areas. And now looking at how rising prices have affected purchasing power relative to key income sources for poor households. Um, and I'll start by just explaining the graph on this slide because it contains several types of indicators. Um, first, on the far left of the slide, we have food prices represented by the cost of the minimum food basket. And then in the middle, we have labor wages for three types of laborers. Uh, and on the right, we have purchasing power for those three types of laborers as measured by the ratio between the cost of the MFB and prevailing labor wage rates. And we refer to the, the ratio um, the purchasing power calculated by this ratio as the terms of trade. And this graph is presenting the value of all of these indicators in October 2022 compared to the same time last year. <clears throat> and you can see that alongside the rising prices, wage rates for laborers have generally increased over the past year on average, driven by the inflation. However, wage rate increases have not kept pace with rising food prices over the years. And looking at the green bars in SBA controlled areas, the amount of the minimum food basket that a laborer could buy from one day's work 
in October 2022 is notably less than the same time last year. And though in IRG controlled areas, purchasing power has also been declining over the years. The terms of trade compared to the same time last year look similar um, because the cost of that minimum food basket was already significantly elevated in October of last year, given a period of rapid depreciation of the currency. So overall, households do continue to be impacted by declining purchasing power across the country. And for some households dependent on other sources of income, income earning has not increased despite the inflation. For instance, households who earn income from civil servant salaries continue to be paid sporadically and the value of salary payments has not been adjusted over the years despite inflation. So in this context, emergency humanitarian food assistance has become a key source of food and income for around half of the country's entire population. And this graph is showing the number of beneficiaries reached with emergency food assistance monthly from December 2018 to October 2022, and also highlights with the colors of the bars two notable periods of scale down during this time frame. And most recently in 2022, the number of beneficiaries reached monthly has declined relative to, to 2021 levels, as you can see. And this is due to the fact that WFP transitioned from monthly assistance distributions to cyclical distributions that occur approximately every six weeks due to funding shortages. Additionally, what this chart does not show is the volatility in ration sizes that have occurred in 2022. Um, whereas previously, each assistance distribution provided 80% or so of households' monthly energy requirements, ration sizes generally declined in 2022 for many beneficiaries, according to data available from FSAC, the Food Security and Agriculture Cluster. And by WFP's fourth distribution cycle, which was completed in September, most beneficiaries received 50% or less of their total energy requirements in that distribution. However, beginning in the fifth distribution cycle that started in late September, WFP slightly increased ration sizes again, with most beneficiaries now expected to be receiving 65% rations per distribution. So overall, both distribution frequency and ration sizes per distribution are currently lower compared to the monthly distributions of 80% rations that many households had been previously receiving for years and come to depend on. And given the highly limited um, ability, excuse me, of most households to expand income earning to compensate for this reduction, and given already highly eroded coping capacity, these assistance reductions alongside rising prices are expected to be resulting in a growing number of households facing food consumption gaps or widening consumption gaps. And that brings us to our current food security outcomes. First, um, in terms of seasonality, again, many rural households are currently expected to be benefiting from temporarily increased access to food and income from the main harvest period. And this is likely reducing the number of households facing consumption gaps and crisis, IPC phase three or worse outcomes across the country though improvements are expected to be temporary as own crop production contributes little to overall food needs. And overall, despite the seasonal improvements, we do expect that crisis outcomes likely remain prevalent across the country at the area level, with millions of households likely experiencing food consumption gaps or engaging in severe coping due to below average income earnings, significantly above average prices, and resulting below average purchasing power. And as denoted by the exclamation marks, we expect that large-scale humanitarian assistance, which remains significant um, despite the scale down, is expected to be preventing area-level emergency IPC phase four outcomes in many areas. I would emphasize though that these are outcomes expected at the governorate level and in areas mapped in phase three, we do expect there to be populations in emergency or worse. And finally, in Marib, we do anticipate emergency outcomes at the area level due to the large share of the population dependent on humanitarian assistance, including the highest population of displaced households in the country, and given continued impacts of conflict on livelihoods. And now turning to expectations for the projection period, 
Looking back at the seasonal calendar, I'll just highlight quickly that the beginning of 2022 is generally an off season for agriculture in many rural areas. And then um, beyond that, Yemen's first rainy season typically occurs from March to May. And alongside this, agricultural activities um, will again begin providing households with some increased seasonal income. So looking at our key assumptions for the projection period, First, we assume that the ceasefire will not be renewed during the projection period, and this is based on increased demands by the SBA side, including the payment of civil servant salaries in SBA areas and the reopening of ties roads that are unlikely to be realized during the majority of the projection period. Given this, we assume that conflict will gradually re-escalate during the projection period, though significant uncertainty exists. In IRG controlled areas, we expect the value of the real will likely remain generally more stable than in 2021, um, but will likely depreciate slightly overall during the projection period given expectations for foreign exchange and absence of government controls. In SBA controlled areas, we expect the currency to remain generally stable and close to current levels. Fuel imports, I'm sorry, fuel prices will likely follow global trends. <coughs> <clears throat> However, fuel imports into SBA areas are again beginning to experience delays given the expiration of the truce. Should fuel shortages resume, this would put notable additional upward pressure on prices in SBA areas. Meanwhile, in IRG areas, fuel prices will also continue to be influenced by the exchange rate. Food prices are expected to remain significantly above average and higher than the previous year based on expectations for sustained elevated fuel prices and in IRG areas expectations for the exchange rate. Access to income from key sources will likely remain below average for most households. However, access to food and income from harvesting activities along the production and marketing change will, chains will increase during the main harvest period lasting through early 2023, um, decline seasonally again following that, and then increase seasonally following the start of the first rainy season and agricultural activities beginning in March. Humanitarian assistance is expected to continue near current levels with distributions to around 13 million beneficiaries once every six months and with rations of around 65%. And finally, looking at the map on the right, precipitation during Yemen's 2023 first rainy season is likely to be below average based on analysis using analog years. Um, and this will likely result in slightly below normal availability of income earning opportunities during that cultivation season. So with that, these are FuseNet's projected area level food security outcomes for Yemen. In the October to January period, as earlier noted, we expect temporary improvement in food consumption in rural areas across the country alongside the main harvest with the number of households facing crisis or worse outcomes expected to decline. However, emergency IPC phase four outcomes are expected to persist at the governorate level in Marib. Then in the February to May period, the agricultural off season in many rural areas will result in seasonally low availability of food and income. And given this and expectations for significantly below average purchasing power and continued redu reduction in humanitarian assistance levels, we expect the population facing consumption gaps and crisis outcomes will increase during this period. And we expect that emergency level outcomes um, will emerge in Haja. Overall area level crisis and crisis exclamation mark outcomes are expected to remain widespread in Yemen throughout the projection period because most Yemenis are likely to continue facing significantly below average access to food and income with above average prices and reduced humanitarian assistance rations, further straining households, limited available resources, and any remaining coping capacity. 